the prison of Grania Canada in Guatemala. Today, the refectory has been turned into a boxing ring. 100 prisoners have come to train and unwind through a workout. fighters, inmates tattooed from head to toe. These prisoners are called Maras. They belong to the ultra-violent gangs who take their name from the Marabunta, an ant that destroys everything in its path. The prison of Grania, Canada is home to the largest concentration of Maras in Guatemala. 1,500 are being held here. Most of them are very young, but already serving life sentences for multiple murder. 24-year-old Jorge has already spent seven years in prison, and he's unlikely to be leaving any time soon. You were sentenced to how many years? I was sentenced to 286 years, but I hope they'll reduce my sentence because the prosecutors haven't got much evidence. Jorge started killing at the age of nine. The first person I killed belonged to another gang. He'd got one of us. I found him, so I decided it was his turn. He didn't kill me, but I killed him. What did you do? I shot him twice in the head. Do you know how many people you've killed? Oh, I can't remember anymore. I don't, I don't know. I've forgotten. Anyway, they're all underground. The Maras are one of the most violent gangs in the world. Extortion, robbery, murders, they've carved up Guatemala. It's almost impossible to get close to them. Yet we managed to spend time with these thugs. You have to pay, get down, get down. Boss, what is it? Well, get in a car and come over here right away with the money. To get to the Maris, we made contact with Freddy. Hello. Are you going? How much do you want to sing a song? Two euros. Okay, let's go. Freddy has been in gangs since he was five. He's just been released after serving a five-year sentence. Can you play No One Lives Forever? His brother is buried here. Like Freddy, he was also in the morass. A rival gang gunned him down in the street. Today, he would have turned 28. Alongside Freddy are his sister Claudia and his niece. They've come to pay their respects to their brother. I'm bitter, yes, but also angry. It's so strong that I cannot even cry. I'm, I'm in so much pain. It's one year ago since he died, but it's like it was yesterday. That's how life goes. It's a game. Sometimes you win. Sometimes you lose. In Guatemala, there's no shortage of work for singers in the cemeteries. Thank you. Have a good day. <laughs> 
Freddy, our contact, lives in a neighborhood of Guatemala City considered by the police to be very dangerous. It's classified as a red zone. Wedged between Mexico and El Salvador, Guatemala is now one of the most dangerous countries in the world and one of the poorest. In Freddy's neighborhood, half the population is unemployed. The Maras member lives here with his sister, his niece and grandfather. Where are you going like that? You're going out to do the same things, aren't you? I've told you already, leave me alone. It's always the same with my sister. You should stay here, don't hang about on the streets. Their mother abandoned them when they were very young and their father is in prison for drug trafficking. Claudia looks after her brother because Freddy is now her only family. My husband was killed here in this neighborhood six years ago. They followed him on a motorcycle and put two bullets in his head. Please don't ask so many questions about everything. Claudia still finds it difficult to talk. In her room, there are several pictures of her slain brother. Is that your brother? Yes. Taken about a year ago. I don't want the same thing to happen to Freddy. He doesn't understand, you see. This is what leads to revenge. And there's no future in it. Just prison or the cemetery. Come on, let's go. Freddy never leaves home without a weapon. Take care of yourself. Not that you ever listen to me. God be with you. Freddy is part of the new generation of Maras, who, to avoid being picked up by the police, do not flaunt their tattoos. Instead, Freddy hides them, along with his weapon, under his clothes. Freddy will show us who the Maras are and how they work. He agrees to introduce us to his gang leader. I'll take you to my leader, but be careful. So what does a leader do exactly? Well, he's our boss. He gives us the orders. And he makes sure we carry them out properly. Now listen, be careful. When we get there, don't stare and don't ask too many questions. Freddy says it's okay to shoot with a small camera. He takes us through a maze of streets. At this point, our safety depends entirely on him. I can keep filming? Huh? Yes. After what seems an age, we arrive at a busy crossing. And we go into this house. Who's that? He's with me. The door is guarded around the clock. We follow Freddy and inside we meet his boss. Hello. Who's this guy? This is the one I told you about. Don't worry. Four more of Freddy's friends, all Maras. Go close the door and close the window. You sure there's no problems with this guy? No, no, don't worry, no problems. We'll search him anyway. Good, he's clean. Okay, but turn off this shit camera. On the edge, the boss threatens us with his gun. Get out of it, and you'll be in trouble. Please don't shoot. Calm down, boss. He's with Freddy. A phone call eases the tension. Hello. 
Listen, did you do what I asked? No, nothing. Listen, you have to do what I tell you, that's it. And if the dumbass doesn't pay, you know what to do. No, not later, now. One hour. I want you here with the money, or I'll send someone to get you. Who are you talking to? Well, what's with the questions? Can you tell us about it, calmly? I sent someone to collect the money that's owed me, that's all. The gangster organizes all the racketeering from this room, calling his men in the field. He's already served six years in prison for trafficking. Watch out. What if he's a cop? No, no, no. No, don't worry. I'm not a... Uh, I'm a journalist. I just want to know how everything works. Well, well what do you want to know? What are you doing here? Just ask your questions. Tell me about your tattoos. Tattoos? Well, it represents the gang we belong to. What does the M stand for? It's M and S. So what does the M mean and the S? It means Mara Salvatrucha, it's our gang. And this says, prisoner for the sake of my mother. Can you show me? Here's the picture of my mother and the prison bars and me. Covered in tattoos, the boss is very conspicuous. To avoid getting picked up by the police, he hasn't left the house for several years. Around him, his team is always on edge. Turn off the camera. We should kill him. We have to know where he's from. Maybe he's lying. Stop it. Damn gringo, he asks too many questions. Put a guard in the door. Make sure he doesn't leave. It's okay, it's okay. I can leave if you want. Why, what do you mean? What do you want? Well, can you tell me a little more? Listen, there's a little scam we're preparing not far from here, so if you have uh, some spare time... Can we come along? Okay. You. Start getting ready. Why don't you let the little crazy guy go? Didn't you want to test him? He can show us whether he has balls. Okay, why not? Are you ready? Yeah, you know, anything for the Maris. Well, this will be your first test to see if you've really got balls. The weapon is loaded, right? Is loaded. See? You'll see who I am. I'll show them who the Maras are. You shoot her once, just once, okay? The bitch. Miguel is 17 years old. He's a new recruit. To be accepted into the Maras, he must prove himself by robbing a shop in broad daylight. It seems odd. So we decide to follow. Here, take this weapon in case. If anything goes wrong, it's better to have two guns. Given Miguel's lack of experience, Freddy prefers to accompany him. Are they really off to rob a store? We have no idea what will happen. They believe all these assholes in this neighborhood. You have to show them what you're worth. Here's the maras that run things. In the end, we don't go with them. We prefer to let them go ahead. We follow on behind. The young man wants to film everything and has a small camera on his chest. We no longer go along. He walks into a small grocery store. Hello. Right, give me the fucking money. You think this stuff is fake? Listen, pay your tax. Get down, and if you look at me, I'll kill you. The whole thing lasts less than 15 seconds. The young hoodlum leaves quickly. 
Alerted by the commotion, another shopkeeper took out his rifle. The robber's camera is still recording. He heads back to the hideout with Freddy, where his boss is waiting. So, okay? What more do you want? We got it, boss. Here's the money. What else do you want me to do? The boss counts up the money. Here's the revolver. He checks to see if a round is missing. Just one thing. Give me a cigarette. He was great. The woman was really scared. So did you kill her or not? No, she was so scared when she saw the gun. But for a first time, you have to show what you got. I was going to kill her, but it's not nice if she has children. We join them back at the hideout. Would you really have killed her if she hadn't given you the money? Yeah, of course, easy. We don't screw around. You'd have no difficulty doing that? No problem. Listen, turn off the camera, because you're now you're pissing me off. You should get out in this camera. It's all right, it's fine, everything is fine. How much money was there? What do you care, man? Just be happy with what you filmed. The robbery was worth 50 euros. The money is given to gang bosses who organize crimes from prison. His business is managed from prison, from anywhere. We must look out for each other. We send money to our friends in prison to care for them, that they can get by. Here, we're all a family. We must stick together to make it. Anyone who doesn't play the game is killed. The Maras are increasingly annoyed by our presence. He'll screw us with his camera. You ask too many questions. Okay, let's go, Freddy. It's time to leave. Okay, come on then. Don't worry, I know where to find him. Freddy and his gang carry out robberies every week. In Guatemala City, there are 300 such gangs of Maras. Working on their own, the gangs crisscross all areas of the city. In the capital alone, there's an estimated 5,000 Maras. This is the central square of Guatemala City. Outwardly, the population lives quietly. Everything is peaceful. But the inhabitants of the capital can fall victim to the Maras at any time. gangs have set up a system of highly organized rackets. One of their favorite targets are taxis. We meet up again with Freddy. Can I come along? No, it's best you don't. You know why? Just stop and take a look. Oh, is that why? Yeah, that's why. You cannot come with me with this big camera. You know what we can do? If you trust me, give me your little camera. The, which one? Your little camera, the one on the chest. Okay, but how do I get it back? I have to come with you. Don't worry, I'll call you. If I'd wanted to steal it, if I'd wanted to kill you, I'd have done that a long time ago. So you want me to go? Yeah, trust me, if you like, if not, forget it. I have to do what I have to do. It's up to you. So, you're going to give me the camera or not? For the time being, we follow him discreetly. The Maras have developed a highly effective technique. Their weapon is a simple cell phone. 
So how's it work? We just leave a mobile phone in the cab and our boss will call him and threaten him. So you'll have to pay. You leave a cell phone? Yes, we leave a phone and when it rings he'll have to answer. Otherwise we'll kill him. That's how it works. Freddy meets up with Miguel, the young Maras who robbed the grocery store a few days earlier. Take the phone. No, no, stop. You, you, you stay there. No, no, you can't. Freddy and Miguel are looking for a victim on the square. They still don't know who their prey will be. There's a taxi waiting. He will be the victim. They choose him as he happened to be the first in line. Miguel will give the driver the phone. Hi, this is an extortion by the Maris. Take this phone, you will receive a call. If you don't answer, we'll kill you. Miguel sets off calmly as if nothing had happened. Freddy follows, and the taxi driver is caught in the trap. His life has just got a lot worse. If he refuses to answer the phone or pay, he dies. Now it's our boss who'll take care of the rest, not us. He'll call the driver now. I just want to tell him that everything's all set. A few minutes later, Freddy hails a taxi. He's wearing his small camera. How much is it to go to Treble? We decide not to get in the taxi. The vehicle sets off and Freddy's camera continues to roll. So, asshole, give me your money. The money. Keep quiet or I'll kill you. Give me everything you've got. Everything. Your cell phone as well, you jerk. And don't try following me. I'll put two bullets in your head. Go on, get lost. This time, Freddy was not following orders from his boss, but acting on his own. He coolly heads off down the street, without looking back. To get by, Freddy will steal from anyone. He's already spent five years behind bars for similar offenses. Newspapers, all the news, free press. In the capital, the papers report on the latest Maras crimes every day. Today, one of the biggest newspapers in the city has an almost banal title. He was holding up buses armed with six phone cells, it says. Madam, excuse me. Is there a lot of violence in Guatemala? Oh, yes. I mean, yesterday, for example, I was held up on 18th Street. They stole my phone in the middle of the afternoon in the center of town. They told me that if I didn't give them my phone, they'd kill me. So I handed it over immediately. There's a lot of insecurity in our country. There are too many maras. It's full of maras in our country. You can get robbed right outside your house. Everywhere here now is a red zone. In Guatemala City, few people are willing to talk about crime for fear of reprisals. This is especially true for taxi drivers. After a dozen others have refused, Gustavo accepts to be interviewed. He's worked as a taxi driver in the capital for 12 years. He earns 300 euros a month and has been held up four times. I thought they were going to kill me. It was something I wouldn't wish on anyone. Just to talk about it brings a lump to my throat. It was so hard being alone with them. Uno se queda 
It was a moment that deeply affected me. I thought of my children. I thought of the little ones and my family, especially. I have four children. They were the ones I thought of first. The Maras wanted to steal my car, but since it wasn't working very well, they couldn't take it. So they started beating me on the mouth and on the arm, and they hit me with the butt of the gun. Gustavo lives in a poor neighborhood. Whenever he has been robbed, he believed he'd never see his wife and children again. Hello, dear. Watching TV, eh? The attacks have left Gustav with both physical and mental scars. I was just driving uh, when it felt like a spike in the belly, and I braked. They stabbed you? Yes, they stabbed me. Look, here and there. You see the stitches? Since the attacks, Gustavo is obliged to pay a third of his salary each month to the Maras. I have to pay 20 euros a week. It's the same for every taxi driver. And he who doesn't pay, unfortunately, will be killed. They come on a motorcycle. Why didn't you go to the police? Because there is no safety. There's no security in Guatemala. The police, well, not all of them, but many are corrupt. If you ask for help, they won't come. Is that why you didn't go to the police? No, I mean, what good would it do? The first thing the Maras tell you is, if you file a complaint, your family will die first, and then you, just for having gone to the police. Every day when he leaves, I pray to God that he comes back safely. Because he supports our family, and we have four children. Guatemala City has about 4 million inhabitants. Each day, violent crime claims about 15 victims. The government has established a special elite brigade to fight the Maras. It's based in the police station downtown. All day long, the victims file in and out. Hello, we've come about a racket. Do you have the document? Yes. Who will file the complaint? It's me. About a week ago, they rang me and told me that I had to pay 5,000 euros. I refused. I immediately hung up, but they rang back and I hung up again. And then three days ago, I found this letter in our mailbox. The message is clear. You son of a bitch, it says, why don't you answer the phone? If you hang up again, we will attack those you hold most dear, your family. We know all about you and your family. Another victim arrives, another threatening letter. The story is always the same. I'm a doctor. I want to make a complaint. I have a surgery and yesterday I received a letter asking me for money. They left a phone number to call? No. Well, go ahead. We'll deal with you and, and try and sort this out. Thank you. That morning, about 15 victims came to file charges. 
Well, it's the same thing with me. I have a small grocery store, uh, very small, because it's all I have. I have nothing else, just a piece of furniture, no window. I sell candy. Okay, we'll take care of you. I want to be protected because they told me they were going to come back tomorrow. Okay, we'll, we'll take care of you. In the office next door, an anti-morass operation is getting underway. A dozen agents have been mobilized and they're at a final briefing. A few days earlier, the police recovered a phone given to the grocer to extort money from him. To trap the criminals, Sergeant Leonidas has decided on an ambush. The owner of a grocery store is a victim of extortion. They asked him for 2,000 euros. The victim gave us his cell phone and we are now in contact with the Maras. They say they want the money dropped off in front of a shopping center, which is located in Area 12. Sergeant Leonidas has designated this policeman to play the part of the extorted grocer. And he'll have the victim's phone and the ransom in cash. You don't move, either forward or backward. This is where you have to hand over the money. The operation is dangerous. Don't forget, your family is waiting for you at home. We must protect each other. In this type of operation, the police are equipped with assault rifles. Last year, Sergeant Leonidas lost four men during one operation. This is an AK-47. A dozen men climb on board unmarked pickups. They head to a shopping center in the north of Guatemala City, where they're meant to hand over the cash. On site, the policeman who's pretending to be the grocer is outside, expecting a delivery of fast food. The rendezvous is due in 45 minutes. Colleagues in civilian clothes have time to position themselves around the mall. Get closer to him. You're too far away over there. We're not that many. Secure the area to the right. And also put a guy next to the truck. They're still not there, but they might show at any moment. That's why we must be ready for anything. Out front, cars cruise past the sergeant. The Maras are probably out looking for the grocer too. This kind of thing can go on for an hour or six hours. There's no limits. Suddenly, after waiting for two hours... That's it. There they are. Yep, there they are. The police officer who plays the grocer is on the phone with the Maras. Sergeant Leonidas is listening in. They said they were coming in a black car and they would open the window so the money can be thrown in. The Maras's vehicle pulls up. Leonidas gives the word. Go. Affirmative. The arrests will be made in the middle of the road. On the ground, get down. Hands behind your back. Where's the other one? Where's he gone? Get up and be quiet. The criminal is hustled away and the police leave the area quickly to avoid being attacked by accomplices of the Maras. So, how was that then? Well, it was fine. We all acted together when we had to. 
How much money did they want you uh, to give them? Here it is. How much? 2,000 euros. This gangster faces between 6 and 12 years in prison. A few days after the bust, this police officer will be killed during a similar operation. There are less than 200 of the elite police across the country. It's not enough to reduce crime, especially since the police are notoriously corrupt in Guatemala and to make ends meet often work with the Maras. Last year, 197 officers were arrested. Today, few in Guatemala have confidence in the police. Militia groups have begun to spring up, especially at night in some areas. Evening. Alvaro has lived in this neighborhood since he was born. Come on, let's go. A mason by profession, he has already been robbed twice at home. The police rarely venture to this part of the city. Have the police lost control here? The police in Guatemala is useless. It serves no purpose. And sometimes we're more afraid of the cops than the Maras. Alvaro used to be a Maras, but today he's fighting them. He's a member of a militia called the Hoods. A hundred men who police the district. Hi, how are you doing? Listen, I'm available to patrol this evening. Super. Okay. Is it important to make the rounds and see what's going on? Oh, yeah, very important. That's the only way we can stop crime and what, what's going on everywhere. We're all armed. We can't go out unarmed. Not just us, but all the people in this neighborhood keep weapons at home. They don't want to give those bastard Maras any chance. Alvaro and the militias are positioned at a crossroads. Hey, how are you doing? So, are you up for this? Who are all these people? This is a group uh, united to fight the Maras. You see, for, for six years, this entire area was a mess. We were at the mercy of the Maras, and many people were killed. But now we've banded together. We've brought weapons, and we're trying to fight back. These people wear hoods to avoid revenge attacks by the Maras. All vehicles are checked as they enter the neighborhood. Evening. Can you step out of the car, please? The people here are used to this. Every motorist is searched by the militia. Uh, what are you looking for, exactly? Weapons? Yeah, we just want to check if they're armed. That way we can avoid any bother later on. Okay, off you go. Since these foot patrols began, the Maras has not shown up in this area. The public feels safer and even the tacos vendors have returned. Before, the problem was the Maras. Did the police come here? I don't know, but there are more hooded people than police now. see. 
that the militias pose a problem as the government disapproves of such civilian self-defense forces. According to the authorities, the citizen militias allegedly killed several people last year. Real executions. So what is the truth? Have the militias become gangsters? We turn to Alvaro again, the bricklayer who'd introduced us to the hoods. Come on, come this way. And you, you go back. A phone call interrupts his work and our filming. Alvaro asks us to leave. And his phone conversation lasts five minutes. Who is that on the phone? Uh, well, I can't tell you who it was. It's confidential. I cannot tell you. Let's just say it's a job, uh, but I don't want to talk to you about it. They pay me, but nobody has to know about it, except the one who, who asked me. At the end of his workday, Alvaro offers to take us home. Along the way, we try and find out more about the mysterious phone call. All right, I'll tell you about it, but I'll be honest. I've never told anyone else. No one else must ever know. If, and if anyone finds out, I could pay dearly for it. Alvaro lives behind these houses, made of corrugated iron. Divorced with two children, he lives with his brother. Has the match started? Yes. How are you doing? I'm preparing the food. After the niceties, we return to the subject of the identity of the caller who rang him at work. So what's this famous work you mentioned? This work that I started telling you about is very confidential. You want me to explain? Okay, good. But we need to get out of here. Alvaro takes us away from his family. Come with me. I'll explain. Here's my home. This is my corner. Come on, come in. Nobody comes here except me. Is there a light? Yes, yes, there's a light. I have a weapon. Do you want to see it? I'm backed up twice now. This one is for my personal defense. What weapon is that? It's a 9 millimeter. It's a special assault weapon. That's what it's called. Even if I no longer rob or steal, this is for a hush-hush type of job. What kind of work? I'm a hired killer, and this is my 9 millimeter. And how old were you when you started murdering people? Oh, I started at 14. 14? Yes. I loved it so much the first time. Uh, after I did it, and... This is how you load up and shoot, see? I also like the mechanism. I was successful, so I continued to make easy money. This is the weapon that makes me money. Uh, but I have another weapon that is very different. And is another side to my life. It's more powerful than this. And I'm sure it's more effective, too. Would you like to see it? Alvaro gets paid to kill people. We're stunned by this revelation. And there are yet more surprises in store. Come and see. 
Porque esta arma tiene dos filos. This. Tiene dos filos y no es arma blanca. It's double edged though, but it's not a knife. Es un libro. It's a book. Es un libro. The book that. Es un libro que mi mamá. That my mother and father hammered into my cabeza. head. Y que siempre desearon que yo hiciera la voluntad del que escribió esta Biblia. They always told me to do exactly what is written inside. It's called Santa Biblia. The Holy Bible. You read the Bible? Yo la leo. I read it. Yo leo la Biblia. And so this and this are my two weapons. Two different weapons. This one has an impact. This has a different sort of impact. Both are weapons with which you can either destroy yourself or set yourself free. Carry on. Well, they can both destroy you. With one, it destroys by taking life from others. And the other can destroy you because of what is written inside. When getting ready to commit a crime, would you pray or think about the Bible? No. No, no. I keep it out of my thoughts. This is the word. And I keep it here in the, in the small bag. And when I do something, I say, forgive me, forgive me, Lord. But they'll pay me. Alvaro has killed 17 people. He gets 2,000 euros per contract, half his annual salary as a mason. The former Maris member is recycling his expertise. He now leads a triple life, a respectable mason by day, a militiaman by night, and a killer. In this poor district, Alvaro's story is almost commonplace. One of his militia buddies is also a killer. A week later, Alvaro invites us to meet him again. He takes us into Zone 18, the most dangerous area of the capital. He wants to show us something. This is a place where there are a lot of maras. At this time of day, the Maras aren't a threat because they're not here. They're doing business elsewhere. In the middle of the night, they show up, they smoke, they drink, they get drunk. They annoy the people that they bump into. This is why there can be no peace in this country. The insecurity is dragging us all down. Alvaro takes up position at the corner of the street. He's tense. Apparently, he's waiting for someone. What's he doing? It's late. Maris, piece of shit. Ah, okay, there he is, I see him. He's the one in the white hat. He's a Maris shit, the son of a bitch. Don't you follow me. has just coldly gunned down the Maras with a shot to the head. The killer is gone. A few meters away, a child continues to cycle by as if nothing had happened. And we leave in turn. Maras, police and civilians. 
dying on a street corner is part of everyday life. In Guatemala, life has no value. Only death can be traded.